Okay, well, let's jump in. Today, um, we're going to focus totally on David's life. Uh, before we had introduced David and Saul, and the kind of David when he was younger, and David's marriage to Michal, Saul's daughter, and basically fleeing from Saul, who was trying to kill him for a number of years. And then uh, basically at the end of the book of Samuel, Saul himself is going to this witch of Endor, Endor, and what happens is this witch of Endor, does the witch of Endor bring Samuel up? No, she doesn't bring Samuel up. She's more startled, I think, than anyone when Samuel actually comes up. She, she's, she freaks out. And then Saul basically talks, interviews with Samuel, and Samuel tells Saul, you and your boys are going to be with me tomorrow, which means basically Saul is told in chapter 28 that he's going to be dead, that he's going to be with Samuel, who had died in chapter 25. So today, we want to look at some things about David. And, and um, the big thing with David, that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take 2 Samuel chronologically. What I'm going to deal with it is more thematically. And the theme that I want to develop is that David was a man after God's own heart. And my question is, what does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? So I want to look at King David as a model of how one becomes and what, what it meant to be a, a person after God's own heart. So in order to do that, I'm going to take themes in David's life. And the first theme in David's life that I want to examine is David's compassion. David's compassion. And so I'm going to go through various uh, scenarios of David's compassion. And we'll talk about David's passion. And then we'll talk about David's hatred of evil. But uh, for first on his compassion, who killed Saul? Does anybody remember reading the end of 1 Samuel? And it says, like, Saul killed himself. And then when you turn over to the next one, and let me just read 1 Samuel chapter 31, uh, down verse 4 and following. It says, uh, The fighting grew so fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. So Saul, a, a guy shot a bow and arrow, the arrow hits him. He's wounded critically. Uh, the, they couldn't get the medevac helicopter into him. And so Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and run me through. Or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. Um, by the way, who also had an armor bearer? Does anyone remember Goliath? Goliath had his armor bearer. And now Saul's got his armor bearer. And the armor bearer probably is really loyal to Saul. Had carried his weapons out for him to battle and things. The armor bearer Saul tells to kill him. And basically, he, the armor bearer won't do it. Uh, does it take quite a bit for a person to kill another human being? It's a big deal. I don't know whether you guys know that in World War II, a lot of the guys that went into battle shot their guns in the air, did not shoot at another person. Because they were basically, there was this, uh, just uh, to, to draw your gun and to shoot another person is a really hard thing to do. And so in a lot of the earlier wars, the people shot their guns in the air. And I forget what it's a huge percentage of guys never really actually put a bead on somebody and took them down and stuff. So it's interesting. Uh, those kind of facts don't usually get out. But what happens is then, but his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, so Saul, he's, he's shot critically, but he's still alive. He falls on his own sword. The armor bearer won't kill him. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and he died. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. And so you have this kind of tragic ending for Saul and things. But what's interesting is when you turn the page, so in chapter 31 of 1 Samuel, it's Saul killed himself. He fell on his sword. He killed himself. That's We call it suicide. He committed suicide and fell on his sword. But, but when you flip the page and you go over to 2 Samuel chapter 1, it says this down about verse 10. There, actually, let me start up a little ways. There's an Amalekite who got away. So there's an Amalekite comes to David. Let me just tell a story. The Amalekite comes to David with the crown of Saul and the band from his arm. Now, by the way, will David immediately recognize that crown as being Saul's? Yes. So the Amalekite comes to David and with the crown and the band and stuff. And then he said, uh, the Amalekite's narrating the story. Uh, I happened to be on Mount Gil Gilboa, the young man said, and there was Saul leaning on his spear with chariots and riders almost upon him. He turned around and saw me, and he called out to me and said, and I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? 
an Amalekite, I answered. And then he said to me, stand over me and kill me. I am in the throes of death, but I am still alive. So I stood over him and I killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could, no longer, he could not survive. I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and I brought them here to my Lord. So the question is, who killed Saul? I, from what I understand, you can only get killed once, okay? So that's what I understand anyways. And so did Saul kill himself or did this Amalekite kill him? And so this becomes a question. And there's basically two options. Now there may be more, you guys are more creative than I am, so there may be more options, but here's two possible options on this. One is Saul was shot. He then fell on his sword, but he was still alive. Uh, when you fall on a sword like that, is it, does a person die slowly usually? And it doesn't take a, a lot in things. And so he falls on a sword, so he's still kind of groveling around. He's still alive. And then he calls out to the Amalekite, come over and finish me off. Okay? And so that's the first scenario, is the Amalekite's telling the truth. Saul was, had fallen on a sword, had given himself a mortal wound, had given himself a mortal wound. He was going to die from the wound, but he calls the Amalekite to say, finish me off quick, more quickly so the Philistines don't catch me and do some sort of torture on me and it gets really ugly. So that's, that, in that case, the Amalekite would be telling the truth. That's possible. I think what's probably more likely is, is it likely that the Amalekite's lying? And then what happened is Saul fell on a sword and Saul died then and the Amalekite is lying to David, grabbed the crown off Saul's head and the band off his arm and brought them to David because what is the Amalekite wanting? It's like, hey, he's wanting a reward from the new king. He's bringing the crown to the new king. And so he basically makes up this story and tells it to David hoping for a reward. Now what's the problem? When David tells, when the Amalekite tells David, uh, question. Do you touch your David? Do you touch the Lord's anointed? No. Okay. And so this Amalekite has now claimed that he's slain the Lord's anointed. So this guy is his own death sentence. And by the way, there's some irony here too. The guy claims he's an Amalekite. Do you remember Saul in, in 1 Samuel 13? Who was Saul supposed to wipe out? What tribal group was he supposed to wipe out? the Amalekites, and he refused to do it. And now you've got an Amalekite standing over Saul in his death. And so anyways, my guess is that the guy is lying, wanting a reward from David. He goes to David. David says, man, you messed with the Lord's anointed. You're a dead man. And so David puts the Amalekite to death. 